petition of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight. O God, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Turning to the disciples, Jesus said privately, Blessed are the eyes that see what you see. For I tell you that many prophets and kings desired to see what you see, and did not see it, and to hear what you hear, and did not hear it. So our Lord Jesus Christ says to you this day, as you have been called, gathered, and enlightened in this church by the work of the Holy Spirit, blessed are the eyes that see what you see. Blessed are the ears that hear what you hear. For you hear in this church, not just man's words, but the word of God. The eternal, unchanging, living, breathing word of God, which accomplishes the purpose for which it was sent. You see today in this church that word of God living and active at work. So that word of God was poured upon Colleen, our newest sister in Christ. And she was fundamentally changed from a child of wrath to a child of God. She was changed as all of us who have been washed in the water and the word have been changed. Blessed are you indeed, for you have seen this, you hear it, and you will hear from this altar that eternal unchanging word which gives life and salvation, not just with bread and wine, but by the holy, true, eternal flesh and blood of your Savior, Jesus Christ. So blessed indeed are your eyes, blessed are your ears. Many prophets and kings desired to see what you see, and did not see it. And yet, what is the condition of our sinful estate? We know that these things are true. We know that God's word accomplishes the purpose for which it's sent. We know that God is here amongst us. We know that he has not left us, nor will he ever forsake us. No, he comes to us. He fills us to overflowing. He gives us every good and every perfect gift here in his church, through his word, through his sacraments. And yet, what is our sinful estate? We are like this lawyer who stood up to put Jesus to the test, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? You see, all of us, each one of us, has a little lawyer lurking in the depths of our sin-darkened heart. We all have a little lawyer that's just waiting for any moment to turn the conversation, to make it not about Jesus and him and his righteous righteousness, to make it not about Christ and him crucified, but to rather say, what must I do? Or more appropriately, in saying what must I do, that little lawyer is actually saying, look at how good I am, God. Don't deny it. You all have a little lawyer in your heart, just like I do. And he's an annoying little creep who's always trying to get attention, who's always raising his hand. You know that kid that sits there and every question the teacher asks, oh, me, 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 pick me, pick me, I'm the best, I'm the smartest, I'm the, I need the most attention. This is what that little lawyer is like. When presented with these blessed things, the word of God and his saving action. What does this little lawyer do? I'm going to put Jesus to the test. This is not a smart idea, dude. You shouldn't put Jesus to the test because he will always win. But this little lawyer can't help himself just as we can't help ourselves when presented with what God gives us. We always want to flip the coin and say, look at what I have for you, God. And so Jesus answers him, what is written in the law? How do you read it, smarty pants? You know what's there. And this little lawyer doesn't miss a beat. He answered, no doubt with great pride at how smart he was, with great pride that he listened so well in Sunday school. He got the equivalent of the gold star in Jesus' day. Every Sabbath day he was there. He memorized his catechism, and he learned it very well. And he says, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind. And your neighbor as yourself. You can almost hear the pride in his voice when he adds that, and your neighbor as yourself. I know all Jesus. I know everything that the law says. I am a lawyer after all. So, Jesus, this is what I read in the law. He said to him, you have answered correctly. Do this, and you will live. Now the lawyer does not quite feel 
look so comfortable. He can't put his finger on the reason why he feels ill at ease, but he knows there's something wrong. He knows that he can't do that. No matter how much he desires to do it, no matter how much he works at doing it, he knows he cannot do it. For if a law had been given that could give life, then righteousness would indeed come by the law. But the scripture imprisoned everything under sin so that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. And so now this little lawyer, that same little lawyer that dwells in your sin-darkened soul says to justify himself. Who is my neighbor? He knows. The game is up now. He can't possibly do all that, so he must look for a loophole. There's got to be an out. Who is my neighbor, Jesus? I can't love everybody as myself, so you give me a list of who I can love as myself, who I must love as myself, and I will get right to work on it. You see, this is what trying to justify ourselves does. It always, always, always takes our vision off of Him who justifies us freely by His grace. When we look at the law as something as though we can accomplish it, and by accomplishing it, we can, by our own reason and strength, by our own works, save ourselves and inherit eternal life, when we do this, we completely lose Jesus. That's not to say that we should abandon the law altogether, we must as Christians strive to be godly, but not for our salvation. When we try to do it for our salvation, we end up trying to justify ourselves, as this lawyer does. So Jesus tells this lawyer a story after he asks the question, who is my neighbor? I want their names and addresses. I want to know where they live. I want to know how much I've got to love them. I want to know how many days of the week I have to do it. Is it every day? Do I get the Sabbath off? Can I hate them on Sundays? What do I need to do, Jesus? I want rules and I want answers so I can inherit eternal life. But Jesus just tells him a story. A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell among robbers who stripped him and beat him and departed, leaving him half dead. Now by chance a priest was going down that road, and when he saw him he passed by on the other side. Well, of course a priest would pass by on the other side, because the priest had to keep himself ceremonially clean. A priest cannot take the chance of being unclean by touching what could be a dead body. The priest has to keep his own righteousness up. And so also a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. Because a Levite also must keep himself clean. A Levite must think of his own righteousness. A Levite and a priest, they have reputations to uphold. They don't want to get mixed up with this guy. Who knows? Who knows what his problem might be? Maybe he deserved to be beaten and left half dead. Maybe he's got the coronavirus. Stay away from him. We can't risk getting unclean. This is what the law does. The law, represented here by the priest and the Levite, and also by the robbers, the law is not interested in mercy and kindness and compassion. The law is only interested in what is right. And so the law says to the priest and to the Levite, it is unlawful for you to come into contact with a dead body. Leave it alone. And the man is not helped. The man continues to lie there in the ditch beaten and left for half dead. Then a Samaritan comes along. A Samaritan has no righteousness in himself. A Samaritan is outside of God's promises, according to the people of Israel. A Samaritan is to be despised and hated because Samaritans were not fully Jews. They kind of play-acted at being Jews. According to the Jews themselves, the Samaritans were not people who had righteousness the Samaritans were not people of good reputation, and because the Samaritan was not interested in maintaining his own righteousness, because the Samaritan knew he didn't have any reputation that he could keep, the Samaritan went headlong to help this man. He had nothing to lose. The Samaritan went and bound up his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. The Samaritan set him on his own animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And the next day, the Samaritan took, takes out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper, saying, Take care of him, and whatever more you spend, I will repay you when I come back. You see, the Samaritan has nothing to lose, 
and thus gives everything. And the Samaritan is none other than our Lord Jesus Christ. But don't tell the little lawyer in your heart that, and don't tell the little lawyer in our reading that, because the little lawyer is constantly looking for a way to do it on his own. Which of these three, Jesus asked the lawyer, do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell among the robbers? And he said, no doubt, quite disappointed, because this seems like a much bigger endeavor than he had ever imagined, the one who showed him mercy. And Jesus said to him, you go and do likewise. This lawyer wanted a means by which he could inherit eternal life on his own. Jesus gives it. You be me. I am the way, the truth, and the life, our Lord Jesus Christ says. If you want to inherit eternal life, you must be as I am. But that's not possible, is it? Can we do this? Can we be Jesus? By no means, that's just making an idol of ourselves. And so the lawyer is sent away, and no doubt, sent away without any hope. But this is the point, because now the law comes in, and now we see who the lawyer is in this story. The lawyer is not the good Samaritan. The lawyer is not the priest or the Levite. The lawyer is not the robber. The lawyer is what each one of us is. The lawyer is the man who was beaten and left for half dead. Because this is what God's law will always do to you. It will beat you up and throw you, in, throw you out. You cannot keep God's law perfectly. And though you should try out of love for Christ, you can never do it well enough to inherit eternal life. So we come here to the inn of Christ church. We are brought here to the inn of Christ church by none other than Jesus himself, our good Samaritan. He places us upon his own shoulders and carries us here into his church. And what does he give? He gives the two denarii of his word and his sacrament. And I have been given these great blessings, not that I can do anything to heal you, by no means, it's all from the good Samaritan Jesus Christ. He gives it, and he gives it abundantly, and what a great hope and comfort I have as your pastor to know, whatever I spend more than the two denarii of word and sacrament, he will supply that as well. And so you see that little lawyer is sent away. He's driven out of this church. He can't stand before the righteousness of Jesus Christ. He will always be put to shame. But the compassion and the loving kindness and the mercy of Jesus Christ will always bind up our wounds, will always heal us. The compassion and kindness of Jesus Christ is what we put our hope and our comfort in. In all situations, in all circumstances, we trust not in ourselves, but always and only in Jesus our Savior has gathered us this day like a heap from that ditch where we were beaten and left for half dead. He gathers us this day, binding up our wounds, binding up our broken hearts. He gathers us this day from a sinful world which would beat us and destroy us. And he heals us. And he gives us a dwelling place. And now we are his. And so we say, have regard for the covenant, O Lord. Let not the downtrodden turn back in shame. Arise, O God, defend your cause. Do not forget the clamor of your foes. We rejoice that God has done it completely. You have seen and you have heard with your own eyes that which prophets and kings desire to see. This day God has saved you. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Son.